Now, I know I won't be able to sing. I guess you can hear me. I know I won't be able to sing like they can. Amen. Or oh me, whichever. <laughs> I've always wanted to be able to sing, but I never could get a bucket with a lid on it that hold the song in, so I just have to go from there. Let's look at our Bible in, in John, the first chapter and the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Now, John is, is trying to give us some information here about Jesus. And so we're going to look at that, but let me, let's see if we can get your attention just a little bit. You know, we think about churches and, and smiles and, and all that, and some people frown. There was once a young boy who went to spend the week with his grandfather on the farm. While w walking around, he noticed the chickens. They were scratching and playing around, and the little boy said, they ain't got it. Next, he came to a colt playing in the field and kicking up his heels, to which he replied, he ain't got it either. After examining all the animals on his grandfather's farm and seeing that none of them had it, the boy finally went into the barn and saw a donkey, and he said, I found it, I found it. And so he called his grandfather in, and he said, I found it. I found an animal that has, a, has religion just like you. He has a frown on his face, and he uh, has a long face and a frown on it. So we don't want to be like that. We don't want a religion like that. Can y'all smile a little bit? Just Okay, all right. Didn't know if y'all got that or not, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll try. All right, when we look at, when we look at uh, John, John, when we look at all the, all the Gospels, now, what is it about the Gospels that, that speak to us that are trying to, what are they trying to tell each one of us? What is each gospel trying to tell us? Now, Matthew, we know that Matthew is speaking of majesty. is talking about the kingship of Jesus Christ. So when we look at the gospel of Matthew, that's what we're looking at. Jesus Christ came as king of who? Of the Jews. So that's what Matthew is pointing to and is trying to point out. Now, many times I look back within my life and I think, well, Chris, what have you done within your life? How do you go about doing things? Well, I don't enjoy preaching as much as I do teaching or as much as I do working with churches and trying to help them to become what they want to become. And what does a church want to become? A church wants to become a living, breathing organism that shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around them. Not only do we want to be that, we want to be able to help people go out and help other people. Isn't that part of our job? Well, that's what, that's what we need to find out. That's what we need to do. And the only way we can do that is searching God's word, praying, and something else. Going out and doing it. Now, if we, if we come in and we sit, you sit there and I'm up here telling you something or I'm preaching the word to you, I don't know if you get what I'm saying or not. The only way I can understand if you're exactly, uh, if you're understanding me is if as soon as you leave here that you do something about what we said. Now that means when you go out tomorrow, when you go to work, when you go to school, when you go anywhere, that you can share Jesus' love with those around you. Now, if we can't do that, that means that I have not my, done my job, or Brother Gary has not do, done his job, or Brother John has not done his job in letting you sing and understand the love of Jesus. So those are the things we're looking at. Those are what we want to become. All right, now this word. What about this word? What is this word that... Uh, that was with God and was God. Is there, you know, is there anything to that? What is this word? Now, 
there's a Greek word. I'm not very good with Greek, except for one I know that owns the delicatessen in uh, Memphis. But the Greek word I'm thinking of, or the scripture is talking, talking about, is the logos. Now, the logos means that it is speech, or it is the word. Not a word, but the word. So when we look at this and we say, okay, what is the word? Well, according to the scripture, the word is Jesus Christ. Now, not only that, but if we go back to Genesis, the first chapter, we find out that God spoke into existence. Well, what is that spoken word? That spoken word is Jesus. Jesus created everything. God the Father was there, but Jesus spoke it into existence. Jesus is the speech. Jesus is the word. So, when we think of, remember when Jesus was in the garden, and he was, he was praying, praying as, as uh, drops of blood or sweat. What is it he was saying? Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. Now, can you imagine how hard it was for him to say that? Not that uh, he was not bowing down or he was not having, relationship, having a relationship with God, but that he was saying, okay, Lord, I don't want, or Father, I don't want to be separated from you. I want to make sure that I always have a relationship. But that relationship was severed for however a short a time it was when Jesus was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, if we look at that word, this word right here that, that God is using in speaking to us, we have to say, okay, Father, you've given me the, you've given us the word that's in Jesus Christ. Now, how can we take this word and uh, apply it to our hearts? Is there any way that we can do it? If we look, my memory is not what it used to be. I used to, didn't, I used to could preach from notes, but I can't preach from just notes anymore. I can't preach from just an outline anymore. Okay, but as we look at this word, we're going to look at the Gospels. Matthew present Christ as the king, as we said. Mark does not have a genealogy because Jesus is presented as the servant so if he's the servant there, then we go down to Luke, and Luke's altogether different because it depicts Christ as man, not just any man, God-man, a perfect man. And then we get to John. Now, when John says, all right, I'm beginning, he's beginning it with the word, the logos. This is um, God in, in spoken word. There never are contradictions in these Gospels. Do you know what a synoptic Gospel is? That means they all coincide. Those synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now John is separate because John is, is trying to present something different. And when John presents it differently, he's presenting it as the Holy Spirit's giving to him, just as the Holy Spirit gave to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So what is, why is John's gospel so important to us. Now John's gospel is made up of short words. Now that way I can understand them. Not the real long words, just the short words. So when he uses those short words, he's making it um, very vividly uh, apparent to us what he's trying to say. This is the reason John is the best book that you can have a new Christian study. It's because all of it's going together and he's using short words but they also are very descriptive words. Now, how can we help a young Christian do something with this? Is there anything special about this? Remember we talked about Jesus as the word, the logos? Well, how can we present Jesus as the word if we don't understand just a little about ourselves? Is there any way that we can try to describe what this Logos is? Is there any way we can describe what Jesus is? Well, when we think of the 
Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, how in the world can we explain what these three are? Well, I can't. You can say, well, it's sort of like an egg. You have the shell, you have the uh, white, and you have the yolk. But that doesn't explain anything because that doesn't tell the relationship. They're all God just as the egg. But you can't understand, okay, what does God the Father do? We know something of what, about what the Holy Spirit does. And we know something about what Jesus does. But what is their relationship one with the other? What is the relationship between God the Father and God the Son? Can anybody give us a good description? It's beyond being uh, described by us. But what we do know is there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are alliterations so that we can know a little bit about what God's doing. But where can we go from there? What, do we, uh, what can we explain? Oop, if my page will come off here. All right. What can we explain about this first verse? Okay, the beginning. We know that in the beginning was the Word. Now, what about in the beginning? Now, you think about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, there was something before the beginning. Jesus was there at the beginning. So when did God come about? God's always been. Now, that, that's incomprehensible for us because we don't know of anything that's always been. Now, we can think about Jello being always being, but uh, he's not that old. Since I've got a few years on him, I can say that. <laughs> Okay, but what we're, what we're looking at is we're trying to say, okay, Jesus was in the beginning, just as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit were in the beginning. When we think about a word, what comes to mind? It has a meaning. It conveys that meaning from one person to another. It has a meaning that when the, that when the meaning of the word of God comes to us, it has a meaning. Jesus is the Word of God. Now, the Indians used to um, have a saying about the white men. The white men would make treaties and then they would break them. So they said the white man spoke with a forked tongue. We think about snakes having forked tongues. What they were meaning more so than that was they say one thing here and do something else over here. I worked for a company one time and I've, I've always been a little on the outspoken side. So I would talked with this guy. I would sat with him. He was the CEO of the company. And we had done all this. And then they made a boo-boo. And uh, so I called them on it. <laughs> they were supposed to pay us at, at a certain time. And they didn't pay us. And so I went in. And I said, now, you have to pay me. And the fellow said, no, we don't, we're not going to pay you until the next pay period. I said, no, you have to pay us now. Nope. So anyhow, I went to the to the state and I went to the uh, IRS and I said okay these fellows aren't paying us well I filled out a form and took it back to them and said it said that they had to pay us right then <laughs> so they didn't want to do that so the the um, vice president called me in and said now you can't go to the state on this we're going to do what we want to do and I said okay so what you're telling me is you'd rather have an IRS audit on all your books then you had to pay me this little bit of money. Well, we're going to do what we want to do. I said, okay. That's when I brought the form back and gave it to the CEO. Next day, they called me. Uh, Will you come in <laughs> into the office and uh, let us talk? I said, well, it's going to be on your dime. I'm not going to pay for it. <clears throat> so they did, and I came in, and I said, now listen. I said, when the, when the state rules or the state laws say that you have to do something, I said, you have to do it. And I said, this guy over here, talking about the vice president, I said, now, um, I said, he can't tell us not that we can't go to the state or to the IRS. I said, one thing, I said, I'm not going to accept it. I said, another thing, he better not ever do it again. Well, you know, he was getting a little red-faced. <laughs> but anyhow, the, the CEO told me, he said, okay, um, We'll make sure th that this doesn't happen like this again. He said, if, if it ever happens again, we'll either write you a check or we'll go to the ATM and have the money in your locker when you come back. 
Well, that was fine. That all went to wor worked out well. So then the next time, he didn't do that. He said he was going to do one thing, and he didn't do that. So I came back, and I, I told him, I said, all right, now you're saying one thing, but you're doing something completely different. You know, why do you tell me that you're going to, uh, just as the other thing, pay me here, and then you don't pay me? Why is this happening? Well, that happens within our lives. One person will say, okay, uh, this is what I'm going to do for you. Remember the old saying, a man's only as good as his word? Remember when you could say something to somebody? I could say to John, John, uh, I'm going to give you so much of my crop. And then it comes back and I don't do it. Well, that's not worth anything. But if I do something, if I tell John this, and he can believe, he can know that I'll do it, then I'm as good as my word. But we cannot be as good as our word is if we don't do what God wants us to do. Haven't we said as Christians, I'm going to lay my life down for you, Lord. I'm going to do exactly what you going to want me to do. I'm going to go out here and witness. I'm going to study my Bible. I'm going to pray for these people. I'm going to go out and help people. Now, if we don't do that, we're not as good as our word. And not just to people here, we're not as good as our word to God. Why aren't we? Why can't we do that? Well, it has to do with sin, and we know how that works. The Word of God. How can the function of the Godhead actually be God? This same personality cannot be really expressed with our limited vocabulary. This Word is the speech of God. I have to get my glasses out again. Us, us older folks have to do that. At least I do, now that I am older. Okay, um, what are we trying to do? Why are we trying to, why are we trying to follow what God wants us to? There was a man who um, had his boys, they were in a boat. They were out in the boat, and boat in the middle of the lake, and the boat starts sinking. Well, he promised his boys he had never leave them. That he had always, he had come back for each one of them. Well, he took the youngest one and took him to shore. And then he swam back and got the next one. And he took him to shore. Well, the father was exhausted by this time. He knew that he had never be able to swim out there and get the last son and bring him back. But he swam out there all the same. Because he wanted his boy to know that he kept his word. He didn't want his son to go down feeling that he was left all alone. His other two boys were there on the shore and they saw this. Well, how can we not be like this? How can we not say, I'm going to do something and then not do it? Especially to our children. How many times have we said, oh, I'm going to take you to the movie. I'm going to take you out hunting. I'm going to take you fishing. I'm going to whatever. And we don't keep that promise. Now, what are they going to expect? Are they going to expect the next time, uh, oh, I'm going to do this, and you never do it. There was once a little girl in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and this broke my heart when this happened. A father told her that he would do something, and he didn't do it. And he told her he would do something, and he didn't do it. And this little girl died because of that. Now, when this all happened, I thought, why in the world did he do this? And the only thing I can come up with is he was letting Satan uh, drive him to do this. He was not a Christian. And when he had this little girl walking around and walking around and promised her something to drink and gave her hot sauce, that broke my heart to see that this happened. And the little girl died. But what about the relationship we have with our children? Fathers, have you ever told your child that you're going to take them hunting or fishing or, or to church or someplace else and you didn't do it? Mothers, have you ever told your daughters that you would, uh, I used to it would be help them sew. I don't know that much anymore about uh, some of the things they want to do. But tell your daughters that. What kind of relationship do we have? Do we have a relationship that they can depend on? 
Or is it something we don't depend on at all? We just say, oh yeah, you'll do that. When a child's been told that so many times, he'll not believe you anymore. He'll want to believe you, but he won't be able to. He was in the beginning with God. Now, this logos, this, this speech, this word, the son, when we think about he was going to be with them, he was with God in the beginning, does that not blow your mind trying to figure out how in the world, in this beginning, there was a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? There was the word that created not only the earth and the universe, but all the animals and you and me. And not only that, he said, I'm going to create you in our image. Now, we know we have a, a body. We know we have a soul. And we know that there is a thinking ability that we have because, because we think. And we can look at all these things. So that's the image that we are in. We are in the image of God. He wants us to know that he loves us more than anything else in the world. How did he create us? Well, we know he, he took some um, dirt and mixed it together and we're here. But what, how did he create us in, that my mind's gone away here. How did he create us so that we could know that we are part of him? What is, what is there specifically in us? Now, we know he created the angels, and we know he created all the animals, and he created man. But what about how do we fit in there? Are the angels higher than man? Or did Jesus Christ create them saying, okay, you are going to be able to, to accept me as your Savior. You're going to have salvation. And the angels didn't have that, did they? What about Lucifer? Wasn't he kicked out of the kingdom? And all his minions that followed him? But you and I, even though that we have a sinful nature, God loves us and he presented Jesus Christ as, for salvation for us. Now, if we, if we know all this and do what he wants us to do, how much better is our life than anybody else's? Isn't Christianity a happy one? Do we want to be like, like the little boy talking about the donkey, that he has the same religion that, that the grandfather has? One a sour religion, one that he's just um, always got a frown on his face, and I guess sort of like the donkey, we hee-haw, hee-haw, instead of uh, uh, our smiling and, and laughing and, and praising the Lord. Now, all things came into being by Jesus Christ. Now, we know that's true because we've already seen that nothing was created without the Word. The Word was spoken at every time. Now, I don't know how, how God the Father, once again, and Jesus... Cor uh, correlate but I do know that they do but Jesus was the creator God the father was there and I don't know the relationship there you have the son Jesus Christ as the word once again and then you have the Holy Spirit what is the Holy Spirit's job today in the Holy Spirit's job to uh, be with us to commune with us, to pray for us. And remember, the Holy Spirit couldn't even come until after Jesus had left. So we have the, the crucifixion, Jesus leaving, and then we have the Holy Spirit coming to us. Remember the day of Pentecost? That was the day that the Holy Spirit came. They had the tongues of fire on their head. But when we think of the Holy Spirit, we think of, of him talking with us, being with us. All right. Once again, we, don't, we can't understand the Godhead. But the, the life is the light of all men. Whose life? The life of Jesus Christ. That's the light that we have within us. That's the light we're supposed to share. 
that's the life when people see us doing good things, they're going to know why we're doing it. They're going to say, hey, uh, I see what they're doing. Why are they doing it? They'd look at Miss Joanne and say, okay, that's what she's, she's out here helping people. She's out here helping with the food, helping people around her. Now, if that's what she's doing, they're going to look at her life. They're going to see that she's involved in church, that she loves the Lord, and that she tries to let the Lord show through her. So when we see this, when we see what she's doing and why she's doing it, then we're going to look back and say, the Lord is good and the Lord takes care of us and all this is shown through Miss Joanne. Now, that's the same way that you and I need to be. We need to be out here and we need to be showing other people that Jesus Christ is real within us. And as Jesus Christ is real within us, then we're going to show that to other people. Now, once again, the, the singing, I can't sing. But if I could sing, I'd love to go into a song right now and tell you about God's love. But what we can do is we can show God's love. If if you tell me you love God and you don't show it, then in all reality, you don't really love God. You're just putting up a front. But if you, uh, if you love God and you show it, other people know it. Who has the highest uh, expectation of a Christian? Is it somebody within the church? No, the greatest expectation for a Christian is the lost person right outside the church. If he sees you doing something you shouldn't do, he's going to say, oh, well, he's not any different than me. I go out and I do the same thing he does. How in the world can we let that settle on our minds and know, well, why in the world is he no different than them? All right, in the fifth verse it says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Remember we're talking about the lost person? When you are sharing Jesus Christ with the lost person, they don't understand it. They're like they're in, the, in, the, in a dark hole. Have any of you ever been in a cave that was very, very dark? You couldn't see anything? I know we were in the catacombs in Rome. And we've gone all the way down. We had flashlights all along. And then all of a sudden, all the flashlights were turned out. You could put your hand that close in front of your face and you couldn't see anything. That's the same kind of darkness the people are in. They can't understand that God loves them. They can't understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. They can't understand that one day Jesus is coming back. They don't understand any of that. The only thing that a, Christ, that a lost person can see is he can see Jesus Christ in you. If he didn't see Jesus Christ in you, he doesn't know anything about, about Jesus Christ. What he's trying to find, what they're trying to find out, they want to look at an example. Where can they find the example of Jesus Christ? They can only find it in a Christian. Moses saw a great light as, as, as God passed by. Remember Moses, he wanted to see God. And God said that he couldn't look upon him. So Moses got over next to a rock. God put his hand over Moses. And Moses saw just a little bit of the Shekinah glory of God as he passed by. Now you and I aren't able to look at God. We, we can look at Jesus. Because Jesus took upon himself the flesh and became man and then when Jesus became man, we are able to see God. Now, the Shekinah glory of God that Moses tried to look at but couldn't is what we, can, um, we will have when we get to be with, with God. Now, have you ever thought about why can't we be exactly like Jesus? Well, we know that we're not God, man. Remember... Later on in the New Testament, Paul talks about seeing through a glass darkly. We can't see very well at all. But then when we're face to face with Jesus, then we can know him and we will be 
like him. Now, we can't see Jesus face to face right now. We can't see God, the Father, or the Holy Spirit. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are going to be revealed to us when we get to heaven. People would like to have Jesus revealed to them today, but once again, that's you and that's me. Can people look at us and see that Jesus is in us? Now, how in the world, you know, we look at, at um, a light. We talked about that light a little while ago. And the younger children here, and, and the older children, and adults too, may remember this little light of mine, remember that? I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That's what you and I are supposed to do. We're supposed to let that light shine. Now, some of you probably don't have that light within you. That light is Jesus. Jesus said, let them come unto me and forbid them not, for as such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, you and I cannot bring people to Christ. We can share the gospel with them. But those of you who do not have the gospel, one, you need to admit that you're a sinner. Two, you need to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And three, you will know that Jesus will come into your heart. Nobody else will be able to tell from the outside. You could be just as happy as could be. You could you know, actually start kids, you could actually start doing what your parents ask you to do all the time. Now, I know that was never my problem. Um, my mother always told me, said, Chris, you know, when you were growing up, you never talked until you, you were three years old. And then you never shut up. So, <laughs> I know your kids don't talk back to you just like, like I did. But if you want to have Jesus Christ into your life, all you need to do is be quiet, bow your head, confess you're a sinner, and ask Christ into your life. That's what you need to do. Adults and other young people who have already accepted Christ, you don't need to ask Jesus Christ into your life. What you have to do is let him shine out of your life. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, as we come to you, we come knowing that you are the light of the world. You are the word that has spoken everything into existence. Not only that, you are the savior of the world. You lived and died and came back again. Father, with this, we thank you for your love. We pray that you'll be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.